I was spotted eagle res in Jupiter. We were just kind of swimming along and I was going to hear Kim screaming through a regulator and she had the video camera at the time. She's chasing these big, two big, huge eagle rays, uh, with some great footage. So that area actually has a lot to, a lot to offer. Um, oh, very cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. We are going to get started, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing so that Doug can take over. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. This is DiVentures doing a series of expert talks tonight with Doug Ebersall. Um, please be on mute if you're not talking. It helps us with the back, back noise, background noise. Um, and if you have a question, feel free to type that at any time. And I'll, if Doug doesn't see it, I'll collect them at the end. So feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat window. Um, okay, so welcome to Doug. Doug is a cardiologist uh, for many years and has been diving since 1974. I think he said he was two when he started, right? Something like that. Something like that. And um, recreational technical diver, open and closed circuit diver and instructor. Um, but he comes to us tonight as a cardiologist consultant for DAN, Divers Alert Network. He's also on the advisory board for several training agencies and such. And uh, tonight he's going to talk to us about the five most common emails he receives as a diving cardiologist. So, Doug, thank you for joining us tonight well, and welcome. Much. All right. Thank you, Joanne. So I'll share my screen here. So um, what I was asked to talk about uh, were the five most uh, common emails that I get as a Dan cardiologist. So as a setup, um, get over here a second. My screen's not advancing, here we go. Um, as was mentioned, I'm an interventional cardiologist by trade. That means I balloon things and stent things and patch holes and fix valves and so forth. Uh, I jokingly say that's what I use to pay for my diving. Uh, as Joanne mentioned, I started diving back in 1974. Um, I do uh, recreational diving, technical diving, cave diving, and I'm an instructor for a bunch of different agencies, both uh, recreationally and technically. Um, and the way all that came about as far as a cardiology consultant is because of my background in diving uh, and diving a lot uh, with a lot of different people at a lot of different types of diving, uh, and people finding out that I was a cardiologist, I started getting lots of cardiology type questions and diving medicine questions um, that there weren't a lot of research answers to. So I started doing some research with Divers Alert Network, uh, became one of their consultants. And uh, so I'm a, I'm a volunteer consultant for them. And I probably get two or three emails or uh, PMs or something uh, per week with some sort of diving kind of question. And I enjoy taking care of that. And uh, I thought throwing also, I'm also in my free time, I'm the Florida sales rep uh, for KISS uh, Rebreathers as well. Okay, so these are the five most common emails that I get uh, as a cardiologist. The first one is patent from the valley. So people who've had decompression sickness with a, with a PFO, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about diving with coronary artery disease. So people who have unfortunately had balloons or stents or bypass surgery and wanting to know, you know when or if can they get back to, uh, to diving. Uh, third is atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm. So people say, I've had this irregular heart rhythm. Uh, is that going to be dangerous? Am I going to be able to get back to diving? A lot of those people are on blood thinners. So the question comes up, can you dive on aspirin and Plavix after a stent? Can you dive on Coumadin or one of the newer agents uh, because of rhythm problems or blood clots and so forth? And then finally, I get questions about people with devices. In fact, I just got one of these uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, somebody with a pacemaker that wants to know, can they dive with their pacemaker or can they dive with an ICD, which is a defibrillator, like a, a shock box. So starting off, then we'll talk a little bit about a patent frame of valley. So what this is, uh, first off, this is a normal variant. It's not a disease. So people with PFOs do not have a disease. Uh, what happens, I, I jokingly talk with my patients and tell them, I think God did a pretty good job in designing our bodies, maybe not knees, uh, but other than knees, I uh, did a pretty good job. Um, so when we are a fetus, the oxygenated blood comes from the placenta uh, because our lungs are collapsed and full of fluid. So we're basically not using our lungs. Well, the whole right side of the heart, uh, the sole purpose of the right side of the heart is to pump blood to the lungs to get oxygen to then come back to the left side and get pumped to the body. So the way God designed that is if you look at the, the drawing on the right-hand side, I know my pointer won't work, but if you look at the top portion there, the, 
a little flap happens. The, the wall between the two top chambers, the right atrium and left atrium, grows up from the bottom and then grows down from the top. And there's a little flap there you see with the arrows are pointing that says blood pressure. And then in the, as a fetus, because the right side of the heart is pumping against these collapsed uh, fluid-filled lungs, there's a lot of resistance to that and a lot of pressure. So that flap gets pushed open. Uh, and what happens is as the blood comes from the placenta into the right atrium, it's able to flow directly across that little flap into the left atrium and go to the body and get uh, oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So that's designed on purpose. When we're born and you open up the lungs, they become much less resistant to blood flow and the pressure drops. And all of a sudden this little flap that you see there that says blood flow, that little flap slams shut. And in about 75% of people within the first year of life or so, that will seal and become a solid wall. Uh, but that means that in about 25% of people, so in one out of four of us, that flap never completely closes. So depending on what's going on, that flap can open or close and let, uh, let bubbles get across or clots get across and cause stroke and so forth. So again, this is not a disease. I, I jokingly say I have blue eyes, which fewer than 10% of people uh, have blue eyes. And I am also left-handed and fewer than 10% of people are left-handed. I'd like to think that neither of those conditions are diseases, uh, but they're simply just normal variants. So again, just realize that this is not a disease to have, but something to be aware of. So people can get in trouble with it for a couple of reasons. The main things that I see them for are what's called cryptogenic stroke. So you'll have young people that had a little blood clot maybe that broke loose from a leg that would normally be filtered by the lungs. If you've got this flap, it can move across to the left side, get embolized up to the brain and cause a stroke. For divers, the same thing happens with bubbles. And so when we dive, every dive is a decompression dive of some sort. And frequently you can get some small little venous bubbles um, that will be filtered by the lungs. If people have this PFO, this flap, then those little bubbles could cross over and get sent to the brain and cause stroke-like symptoms, get sent to the spinal cord, cause paralysis type problems and so forth and so on. The problem is this is not a typical murmur. You, know, you hear about people having murmurs or valve problems that we can pick up on physical exam. They're, prior to having ultrasound, echocardiography, which is ultrasound of the heart, it's, it was next to impossible to know someone had this. I mean, history is normal. There's no physical findings. The EKG looks normal. Chest x-ray looks normal. So there's no way to pick it up. Um, currently, we can look at uh, three different types of echoes, what's called a transthoracic, a typical echo, which is just done from the chest wall, which is the, the way we always start looking for these. Uh, what's called a transesophageal echo, where we actually go down the, the esophagus, the food pipe, because that's very close to the heart, allowing for much better high quality images, which we can use if we need to, based on what the findings were on transthoracic, if it was poor quality. And there's a, something else called a transcranial Doppler. And the concept of a transcranial Doppler is you inject uh, at what's called agitated saline or little uh, micro bubbles into a vein, all those should be stopped by the lungs you then image over the temporal artery kind of on your head. Uh, and if you sound what, hear what sounds like a, um, a Geiger counter going off, then those bubbles have clearly crossed over from the right side to the left side. That doesn't give you any idea where that crossing over happened because you're not actually imaging anything. So it could be in the lungs, could be in the heart. But in general, the, the top one there, the transthoracic echo, the regular echo is how we usually screen for these things. So how do we find out about this? By the way, you're asking about best dives, by the way, this is Blue Corner at, uh, at Palau. That's gotta be one of the top dives. Um, so how do we find out about this? Well, an air gas embolism through an atrial septal defect, which is not a flap, but an actual hole, uh, was first described back in 1986. Uh, and people said, hmm, that's interesting. So then people started looking at echo studies for unexplained uh, decompression illness. And what they found was that in two different studies, rather than have around 25% of people having PFOs, we had more like 40 or 40, you know, 37 to 43% of people with PFOs. So suggesting that maybe the PFO was kind of what's going on here. So that's much higher than the general population of 25%. Back in 2001 in, in an Annals of Internal Medicine study, they looked at divers and they basically found that if you have a PFO, uh, your likelihood of developing decompression illness compared to the normal population is about four to five times higher, though the overall incidence is still low. This was confirmed in a second study in 2004. Uh, again, looking at 230 divers, 63 of whom had a PFO. And again, compared to divers without PFOs, the risk of decompression sickness was about five times higher. So that, on, on first glance, sounds terrible. But the key is that's a relative increase. And what you have to really look at is the absolute number. 
So the likelihood for a recreational diver developing decompression illness is about two episodes per 10,000 dives. So very, very uncommon. If you multiply that by five fold, it then becomes 10 per 10,000 or one in a thousand. So it's still a very, very low incidence, even in the run of the mill diver with a PFO, which is why we don't routinely screen for this. So should we routinely screen for it? No, because there's a very small incidence of decompression illness, but 25% of the population has a PFO. So what will happen is you get large numbers of people with PFOs. We have no idea what that's going to mean to them. It's just going to scare a lot of people. However, there are certain forms of decompression illness that have a much higher likelihood of being associated with a PFO, and those types should be screened for. And that's these types here. So if people have symptoms that behave kind of more like an air gas embolism with cerebral um, symptoms, such as stroke-like symptoms, or they have spinal cord issues, which would either be a paralysis or a urinary retention, cutaneous, which is skin bends, um, and inner ear bends, which would be a lot of vertigo and so forth. So those are the four types. So cerebral, spinal, cutaneous, and inner ear. If you have decompression illness of those types, not your typical joint pain uh, or just a mild fatigue, uh, if you have those symptoms, you should clearly be at least consider looking for, uh, for a PFO. So what if you find that? What if you get bent uh, and someone checks you and you have a PFO? What do you do? Can you return to diving? And the issue there is you always have three options. Uh, the first option is you could always stop diving. If you don't dive, you don't get bent. Uh, I jokingly tell people that I don't ever see those people. They show up in my office. They've already decided that that's not what they're going to choose. Uh, but that is always an option. Uh, and that frequently is chosen by somebody who say this dives maybe once a year on vacation when they're on a cruise ship and they say, you know what, I'll just do some other activity. But the majority of people that I see want to continue diving and want to do it safely and want to know how they should do that. Well, there's two approaches if you're going to continue diving. One is you can dive conservatively. And the issue to remember there is it's not the PFO that's the problem. It's the bubble load. So anything that you can do to decrease your bubble load uh, will decrease your likelihood of decompression illness, whether or not you have a PFO. So for those PFO patients, they should dive well inside the no decompression limits, try to limit themselves to one, maybe two dives per day. You'd want to dive nitrox, but set your computer to air as long as you don't exceed your MOD. Again, just adding a safety margin in. And then intentionally lengthening safety stops, uh, especially at shallow stops, and avoiding exercise uh, for several hours after diving. That's kind of how diving conservatively has been defined and been shown to be helpful. And then if you've already tried that and you've had issues, um, then PFO closure for selected people is reasonable. This is what the PFO closure device looks like. It's uh, two little discs uh, made out of a metal called nitinol, so you can collapse it inside a, uh, inside a catheter. Uh, it's got a little spring-loaded uh, attachment there. We can actually unscrew that when we have it in place. So this is from a cartoon standpoint there on the right, kind of how this is done. If you look at the left side, there's that little flap with the arrow going through. We uh, put a little catheter across the flap, uh, deploy one disc, that's the upper right uh, portion of the diagram, which is over on the left-hand side. We then pull back and unsheath the other one on the right-hand side, on the, like you see there on the right lower corner. Uh, once we have things in place, we just unscrew the, cap, the uh, cable that's attached to, leave it behind, and over about three months, your body kind of heals that over. Uh, sounds like a big deal, it's actually not. Um, it's all done through a needle stick. This is not surgery. Uh, people go get them done in the morning. I did three last week that were all home by two in the afternoon. Um, so it's just done with a single needle stick, um, done under conscious sedation, similar if anybody's had in some sort of an endoscopy or a colonoscopy or an upper, uh, upper endoscopy where you're kind of in la-la land, but uh, not really under general anesthesia. It usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes. We send people home the same day, and they go home on aspirin and Plavix, uh, which is clopidogrel, for about three months while this is healing. And the recommendation is to have a follow-up uh, echo with a bubble study to make sure everything's sealed uh, at three months. And if that looks good, people can return to diving with, uh, with no restrictions. I'm just gonna walk you through kind of how one of these works. This was a friend of mine, a technical diving friend of mine, who had had multiple type one uh, bins, both skin bins and joint pain. Then while he was in um, uh, truck, had two episodes of type two neurologic bends. He had transient paralysis, uh, which resolved uh, with recompression therapy. Um, the second, like I said, was diving in truck. And then this guy had a, had a plan the following year to go to Bikini Atoll, which if you've ever been to truck, that's not, you're not even halfway to Bikini Atoll. So it's, uh, uh, he was gonna be in the, literally in the middle of nowhere. 
So we opted to close this PFO after we found it. So this is the, uh, the image on the left is what we see on an x-ray screen. So you see that one little disc being deployed like we showed on the cartoon. The more vertical line that's got the really dark black uh, short little segment to the left of that is our intracardiac echo. So we actually use an, an ultrasound device actually inside the heart to watch the imaging. And that picture is seen on the right-hand side of the screen. I think you can see coming down from about 10 or 11 o'clock down towards four o'clock, kind of that double line is the, uh, is the catheter. And that's attached to that uh, kind of horizontal bright white disc. That's the disc going into the left atrium. We then deploy both discs uh, there on the left. And on the right, you can kind of get a feel for uh, the two discs across the septum. We then unscrew the cable, leaving it behind. And that's what it looks like on the x-ray there with the two discs look you'd see on a chest x-ray. And then on the ultrasound image, I think you see there's two really bright uh, objects, kind of one that's kind of going from about 2.30 to 8.30 and one that's kind of close to more like three to nine o'clock. That's what the two discs on either side of the septum. Again, this took about 30 minutes and uh, he went home the same day. So a lot of questions had come up to me on PFOs and you know, there's risks involved with procedure though it's very, very low. Uh, and the question is, does it really help? And I got lots and lots of these um, questions. There wasn't a lot of data. So Petar de Noble, who was at the time was in charge of uh, research for Dan, we literally got together um, at a bar one night in Dima and sat down with a cocktail napkin and tried to figure out how we could uh, come up with a study to, uh, to better decide what to do with these people. So we came up with a study. It was a prospective study with five years of follow-up uh, with divers who had had their PFO closed uh, versus divers who had a PFO but opted just to dive conservatively to see kind of how they would do. Uh, we tried to control as much as we could. The divers logged all their dives, uh, whether or not they had, you know, all the details of their DCI, though how big the PFO was, kind of the overall health status. Uh, and then we just kind of followed them uh, over five years. The problem is this is not the perfect design. I mean, the, the absolute perfect design for a study uh, from a medical standpoint is what's called a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. What that means is it's randomized. So there's a flip of a coin. Uh, it's double-blinded. That means the patient and the doctor neither know what the patient received. There's a placebo, which in this case would be no closure, uh, and that's how it's controlled. So ideally, if you could do that kind of a study with several hundred divers from all over the world randomized to a PFO closure versus a sham procedure where you just put them to sleep, uh, get them sleepy, put a little needle stick in the leg uh, to not actually do anything, uh, and then you'd have to have them followed up with a physician who was blinded to what they had so they could be, uh, not be biased as to whether or not they're having symptoms. And then you'd want to have long-term follow-up, like maybe even up to 10 years. So that's just unfortunately not practical. Uh, we don't have funding for that sort of thing. So this study was actually more of an observational study. So the patients decided on which therapy they got, whether they were going to decide to dive conservatively or get closure. And that includes lots of bias because you may have people that are worried and be more likely to, to complain of symptoms. You could have people who say, oh, I've had my PFO closed, so this symptom I had really wasn't anything and not report it. Uh, there's recruitment bias and so forth and so on. So it means the, the two groups could be quite different. Uh, so we had to be very careful of that. But we, um, we got through this study. It was published last year. We had 77 patients enrolled with a mean follow-up between five and six years. And you can find the study uh, in diving and hyperbaric medicine from uh, last June. The reference is down there. So basically what we found was luckily, though we didn't randomize people, we still got very lucky with similar ages, years of diving, total number of dives in each of the two groups, uh, and found that uh, the number who stopped diving or dove less after DCI was about the same. Um, and this is kind of where we saw as far as uh, reductions and so forth. What we really found, uh, I'll show you in a, a slide or two, these are the two different groups. The conservative group versus the closure group. Um, very, very similar um, with more people with large PFOs in the closure group. So in the closure group with six years of follow-up, we had 42 subjects prior to the study. If you remember me saying the normal incidence of decompression sickness is about two episodes per 10,000 dives. These people with their PFO were a sub, you know, were a very select group of people where they had a instance more like 13 events per 10,000 dives. But after follow-up, uh, this dropped dramatically back down to 2.7. So basically back to what you'd expect for someone who does not have a PFO. So that was a statistically significant five-fold reduction. In the conservative group, uh, again, about five to six years of follow-up, they had a reduction, but it did not meet statistical significance, but it was still quite good. It still dropped from around 13 events to 3.4 events. So I think either approach is very, very reasonable and very defendable depending on what type of diving you want to do. Uh, this was a small sample size. Uh, it's self-report outcomes, but it's the best that we have. So 
with divers to get rid of this number one of our five topics uh, and the others go much faster. Um, what you have to realize is the primary cause of the decompression illness is the inert gas bubble, not the PFO itself. So if people have a PFO, we should inform them that they have an increased risk. That risk is about five-fold higher than it would be if they didn't have it, but the absolute risk is still quite small. Uh, and we should advise divers to dive more conservatively. They should dive fewer dives per day. They should dive shallower. Consider having diving nitrox, but with their computer set to air and doing long safety stops. If that is ineffective, um, then they should have, consider a transcatheter closure for very selected individuals. That's a discussion that we have one-on-one -on -one with the doctor and the patient to decide what's best for them as an individual. Okay, so that's kind of the PFO. This is the guidelines. This is from the South Pacific Underwater Medical Society. Um, it's got the, exactly the same recommendations come from the UHMS. I was on that committee. So the recommendations are the following. Routine screening for PFO at the time of dive medical fitness is not indicated. Again, like we mentioned, very high incidence of PFO, very low incidence of decompression illness. So you don't need to look unless people have had a problem. Consider investigating for PFO for people with the four types we talked about, cerebral, spinal, cutaneous, or inner ear decompression sickness. There's a lot of conflicting data on migraine with aura. We know that migraine with aura have a higher incidence of PFO. Uh, there's some evidence that closing PFOs may be helpful. I'm purposely soft peddling that because randomized studies haven't uh, shown a definitive answer on that. If people have had a cryptogenic stroke, that's basically a stroke for no good reason, especially a young person. That's another indicator of a possible PFO. Um, and also if you've had things at first degree relatives because they can be uh, hereditary. If screening is performed, it needs to be done uh, in people who do it a lot. Uh, when you do this transthoracic echo, it's not a regular echo. We do, it, we do the standard echo, but then we also inject these agitated bubbles in through a vein, and you need to do provocative maneuvers such as valsalvas and sniffs and so forth so you can get the bubbles to go across. If those procedures are not performed or the filling of the heart is not very good with the agitated saline, you can definitely get a falsely normal study. Um, large shunts... Um, like I said, are associated with, uh, with the types we talked about before. Small shunts are a little bit harder to deal with. Uh, it's hard to know what to do with that, but uh, something to think about. Again, if you dis demonstrate a PFO, your options are you can stop diving, dive more conservatively, or for selected people, uh, they close the PFO. And divers who've had a PFO closure should wait uh, for three months till they've had a follow-up echo that shows uh, no further shunting. And then those people can easily return to diving with no restrictions at that point, with a risk similar to people who never had a PFO in the first place. Okay, we're going to move on to coronary artery disease. This is a true story. This happened to me several years ago. Uh, I got a phone call in uh, the middle of the night that they'd had an individual who had sudden death uh, while pumping gas at three o'clock in the morning here in town. Uh, bystanders started CPR. Uh, the emergency medical system brought the patient to our emergency department where an EKG showed he was having a big uh, anterior wall MI, that's a heart attack involved in the front wall of the heart. And our STEMI call, and that's our heart attack team, was called, and we all scrambled to come in from home. This guy had no history of smoking. He had no history of diabetes. He had no history of hypertension or high cholesterol, and no family history of coronary artery disease. So he basically had no of the traditional cardiac risk factors. This EKG you see on the right, I don't expect anybody to know how to interpret this, but just trust me, you don't want your EKG to look like this. Uh, that V1, V2, V3, those big tall things are called tombstones, and that's not for any particularly good reason. Uh, and that is a suggestion, by the way, that EKG looks that somebody has a blockage in the proximal LED, which is called the widow maker, which also is probably not for any particularly good reason. Um, so we took this guy to the cath lab, where the arrow is pointing, it doesn't project real well, but there's a 99% blockage in that proximal LED. Interestingly, of his other two vessels, he had a tight blockage that's pointing at a vessel called the circumflex, the two of the three vessels. And then on his third vessel, he had this area in the proximal that was starting to be a problem as well. So this person had an obvious culprit, uh, which we opened up. This is after stenting, uh, and it looked beautiful, and the patient did well. Um, but the reason I brought this up, and this is kind of a standard thing, what's the most impressive part of this case in this guy who had no traditional cardiac risk factors? He was 32 years old. Okay, we all like to think that heart disease happens to our grandparents. Okay, so you like to think this happens to older people, but it happens to lots of young people as well. So just the fact that you happen to be young uh, and happen to be healthy uh, does not mean you don't have coronary disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that in diving. This is the annual record of U.S. and Canadian fatalities from the Divers Network. So you see about 100 people a year 
uh, die scuba diving in the US and Canada. So how does that correspond to other things? So about 100 people die. So 25 people a year or so die from champagne corks. I thought that's fairly interesting. Uh, 100 people, so it's about the same. Your risk of, diving, of dying while scuba diving is about the same as dying from swallowing a ballpoint pen. Uh, and it's actually less than you're likely of dying from a falling coconut while you're in, in the Caribbean. Um, electrocuted by toasters, I have no idea how that happens these days, but electrocuted by toasters, 850 people and accidental gunfire of 1,500. So it's not a lot of people who die scuba diving, but they tend to be young, healthy people, and obviously any death is too many. It's felt that ischemic heart disease uh, is involved in over 25% of scuba diving fatalities in those over the age of 35. That's not in the age over 65, that's in the age over 35. So again, these young people have this. And in fact, ischemic heart disease, which is coronary disease, is the number one cause of diving deaths for those over 50 years of age. So anybody over 50 that drops dead in the water, the more likely reason they died is gonna be underlying coronary disease. So there's a lot of coronary disease. And if you look around dive boats, there's a lot of people over the age of 50 diving. So you, that's why this comes into play. So the growth of scuba diving since it began back in the 1950s has resulted in a large population of divers over the age of 45 for two reasons. First off, there's old people like me uh, who began diving uh, in the 50s and 60s and now are continuing to dive. But also we've made diving safer, the equipment's better, the training's better. It made it more of a, a kinder, gentler kind of uh, training. So lots of people over the age of 45 who are at risk for coronary disease have started taking up scuba diving. So this is, we're all getting older, okay? This is Arnold Schwarzenegger on the left uh, in his prime. Uh, and this is Arnold Schwarzenegger now, okay? I'm sure Arnold Schwarzenegger in his mind still looks like the guy on the left. Uh, to the rest of us, he looks like the guy on the right. And I'm not going to just be picky for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, this is me in 1978 scuba diving, and this is me last year. So again, I would like to think I'm still the guy on the left, uh, but I'm actually the guy on the right. Okay, so we ought to be realistic at what our skills are and kind of how, uh, how we've aged and kind of how things have happened. Don't you love the big dive night there on the thigh that we used to always do? Okay. All right. Here, though, is the exception that proves the rule. Okay, if, you, if anybody remembers the movie or heard of the movie Blue Water, White Death, uh, that was done by Ron and Valerie Taylor uh, back in the 70s, and the, the underwater cameraman was Stan Waterman. Uh, this is the three of them diving with my friend Jim Abernathy uh, on his boat in the Bahamas with Ron and Valerie at age 80 and Stan Waterman at age 86. So we want to be these guys. You know, these, these, these are the people we want to be. So the question is, how do we be those guys? So what can we do to try and be these guys going in the water and not a statistic? Well, despite the decline in death uh, since 1968, that's when the Surgeon General came out with a uh, warning about cigarette smoking, we still have about 650,000 Americans dying every year from coronary disease and about 2 million more develop symptoms without actually having um, uh, an MI and so forth. And acute MI, which is a heart attack, is the most common presentation in the, pres in the population at large. That's important because if people simply develop chest pain uh, and would have an abnormal stress test, then we could just treadmill everybody every year and we would pick up everybody. The problem is most people have no, no symptoms one day and a heart attack that night uh, that you would not be able to pick up with treadmill testing. So we have to go after risk factors and try and keep those things modified. Unfortunately, sudden cardiac death, meaning people just dropping dead, uh, is the presenting symptom in about 15 to 20% of people. And in people who have known coronary disease, uh, about 60% of the causes of death are sudden. Uh, so again, those are concerning, obviously, for underwater. And again, coronary disease is probably the most common cause of sudden cardiac death that occurs while scuba diving. So if someone just drops dead for no good reason underwater, most likely it's from underlying coronary disease. Um, by the way, Kim's the one of the third one from the left there. Um, this is, uh, I love this picture. This is actually my father, uh, my wife, and our two kids. So it's Kim and Eric uh, back in like 20... You remember, Kim, when we the Bahamas 2014-ish or something like that, maybe? Something like that. Um, so you haven't really known a good time until you've looked over and seen your father swimming along with your children underwater. That was, a, that was uh, one of the more memorable moments. But anyway, so how do we be people like my dad and be scuba diving at age 80 here? Um, there are certain cardiac risk factors that we cannot change, like age uh, or family history. None of us get to pick our parents. Uh, but certain things we can. If people smoke, they can stop. If they have high cholesterol, that can be treated. If they have diabetes, it can be treated. And if they have blood pressure issues, it can be treated. So going after the things you can go after and just accepting the things you can't. So 
if this is happening this commonly and there's this many people having cardiac issues as they get older and having issues underwater and lots of people dying underwater, how should we screen for that? Well, treadmill testing can work uh, and it basically is used just like we would use for anybody who wanted to pick up a new sport. Let's say if somebody has been a couch potato and they said, I'm going to pick up playing tennis or I want to start jogging. Um, if they're over the age of 40 and they've not been exercising, it's probably very reasonable, especially if they have some risk factors, heart problems, to put them on a treadmill before you allow them to pick up, to start those activities. Now, I would say the same thing would hold for uh, scuba diving. So if someone's been totally inactive, uh, they're older to middle age, especially with risk factors, it would not be a bad idea to put them on a treadmill to make sure they don't have some underlying coronary disease uh, before allowing them to take scuba training. Same thing would go for people under 40 if they're very poorly conditioned with lots of risk factors. It's currently recommended um, to participate in scuba diving that people will be able to achieve what's called 13 METs, that's metabolic units on a treadmill. Um, that is an old uh, recommendation, which is based on uh, exercise physiology. It's about 10 to 11, a little less than 12, about 10 or 11 minutes on a Bruce protocol, which by that point you're running, you're basically jogging up a hill. Uh, and I'll tell you, if you look around the dive boats, the vast majority of people on dive boats, I can guarantee you cannot hit that number. Um, so because of that, uh, Fred Beauvais, who is a, a very well-known um, cardiologist, uh, who was president of the American College of Cardiology for a while, uh, and also wrote a book on diving medicine. He and I had some discussions about this. And basically, we've changed the recommendations now to looking also still at the physiology, which is if you can hit 13 mets on a treadmill, that means you can sustain 50% of that or about six and a half mets for, for 20 minutes or so. And that's about the level of swimming against a one knot current. So that's kind of how we've picked that number. So if you can walk 12 minute miles, that's about six and a half mets. So if you've got somebody that wants to start scuba diving uh, and they can walk two miles in about 25 minutes, that's adequate for recreational diving. So that's a, a, good, a good marker that you can use for, for conditioning for, for people. They can walk two miles in 20, 25 minutes you're in party pretty good shape for recreational diving. So once people have coronary disease, because this is the people I hear from all the time, which is they said, oh, I had a balloon, I had a stent, I had bypass surgery, can I return to diving? Well, the, the contraindications to diving would be active chest pain, angina pectoris. Uh, if you've had a heart attack that caused your heart muscle function to be weak, uh, that's a problem. And the reason for that is because just immersion in water will shift about a pint and a half of blood to your central circulation. Uh, to your heart, basically. And if your heart muscle function is weak, uh, sometimes your heart can't tolerate that and it'll put you into congestive heart failure. So you want to have normal heart muscle function and you don't want to have any what's called ischemia, which is limitation of blood flow rate rhythms because they have to have that underwater and lose consciousness, they would drown underwater. So once people have had uh, balloons or stents or bypass surgery, if they have a treadmill that's normal, so they have no evidence of, of ischemia, which is a uh, limitation of blood flow, they have normal heart muscle function. They're not any drugs that, that screw up their exercise tolerance. Uh, and they have some sort of annual testing. Uh, those people can return to diving. Now that doesn't necessarily apply to all professionals or technical diving. And it definitely doesn't apply to commercial diving who have their own count, their own um, uh, guidelines. And you should tell people that with coronary disease that yes, they are at increased risk uh, compared to the general population, but it may be a very small risk depending on how, what their exercise tolerance is and how their treadmill really looked and so forth and so on. So. We still count people, they are at a slightly increased risk, but if they have a normal treadmill and normal heart muscle function, good exercise tolerance, they can return to diving without a problem. All right, email number three, which is rhythm problems. The most, most rhythm problems are not an issue. Uh, the one that we're gonna talk about is what's called atrial fibrillation. This is something that affects about one or 2% of the general population. The main problem from a medical standpoint is it increases your risk of stroke uh, by about five fold and accounts for about 15 to 20% of all strokes. Uh, and unfortunately, these strokes tend to have, tend to be bad strokes. So because of that, people end up on blood thinners. So you have two issues here, which is the rhythm itself and what are your issues if you're trying to go scuba diving on blood thinners. So we recommend people uh, who have other medical conditions like this or age uh, issues to, uh, to go on blood thinners. Unfortunately, uh, these can cause bleeding. The major risk, uh, or the risk of major bleeding is around two to 3% per year. And that's whether you're on the classic drugs like warfarin, which is also called Coumadin, or some of these more newer agents that you hear advertised on television all the time, uh, like Pradaxa or um, Zeralto or uh, Eliquis, which are the ones uh, down at the NOACs there. 
It's oral anticoagulants are not an absolute contraindication of diving. Uh, you need, must weigh the risks and benefits. There is an increased risk of minor bleeding with trauma, uh, like cuts and bites and so forth. Uh, so yes, if you're bitten by a shark, you will bleed more if you're on blood thinner than if you're not, but the problem is not the blood thinner, it's being bitten by the shark, right? So that's not that big of a deal. Um, there is an issue where you could have, if you were to have, um, let's say middle ear barotrauma or sinus barotrauma, you'd be more likely to bleed into that area. So that is a, that is a nuisance bleed. That's not a life-threatening bleed, uh, but something you need to be aware of. So you want to be careful with, uh, with equalizing and so forth. There is a theoretical um, risk that if you said, okay, I'm on blood thinners and I had a decompression uh, illness uh, and it was, let's say for argument's sake, a spinal cord issue. So I was paralyzed from it. And then I was on blood thinners. Could I be more likely to bleed into that area so that I'd have more residual problems or a, or a bigger insult than I would if I was not on blood thinners? Theoretically, the answer would be yes. There's no data of that, but it just goes into discussion for people deciding from a risk benefit standpoint, uh, whether they should stay on uh, blood thinners, or should they stay diving if they're on blood thinners. But there's a large, large number of people who are on blood thinners and dive safely every year. Okay. So that's the last of those uh, things, except the devices. So the last of the five things I hear about are pacemakers uh, and defibrillators. So one approach would be no one who has a cardiac pacemaker should ever scuba dive again. And that is the conservative answer. And that is probably the answer you'll get from lots of cardiologists. Um, and the reason for that is I'm not being critical is we are all trained to do no, you know, above all do no harm. So if you, don't know the answer to something that someone's asking you, you're gonna err on the side of trying to be conservative to not put them at risk. And if you have people who don't really scuba dive or don't really appreciate why people have a passion for it, they would say, just stop doing it, okay? Um, but an alternative approach uh, is to say, okay, not does the patient have a pacemaker, but why do they have a pacemaker? Um, because there's lots of different reasons people have pacemakers. Some people are what are called pacemaker dependent, meaning that if you turn off the pacemaker, they have no underlying rhythm whatsoever. Okay, those people I'd be a lot more worried about than somebody who had a pacemaker could in because they had passed out uh, and somebody saw a slow heart rhythm once, they got a pacemaker, and when you interrogate the pacemaker, they haven't used that pacemaker in several years. That's a much lower risk person. Um, and then the next question is, what is the individual pacemaker rated uh, as far as depths? Um, these pacemakers are not solid objects. They have air spaces in them. And we all know what happens with Boyle's law. Okay, so as you go down, the air spaces are going to get smaller and that can collapse the pacemaker can around the battery sort of thing around the pacemaker. So uh, you've got to be aware of what the depth rating are. The pacemaker agencies don't really care about scuba divers, I'll be honest with you. So what they really rate them for is hyperbaric therapy for wound care and so forth. There's a lot of elderly people with diabetes or something or bad peripheral vascular disease that need hyperbaric therapy to get better blood flow to their limbs. Uh, and they need to make sure the pacemakers are safe for that. So most of them are rated for around 100 feet uh, just to be safe for, um, for hyperbaric therapy. So with pacemakers, Diver candidates with pacemakers are not gonna be allowed to do commercial, military, or scientific diving. That's th their own individual uh, restrictions. For sport divers, like I said, we have to individualize this. We have to know first off, are, the pacemaker, are they pacemaker dependent? So if something were, God forbid, to malfunction under pressure, do they have an underlying heart rhythm that would keep them alive? Uh, secondly, what is the functional status of patients? In other words, some people with pacemakers, they are dependent and the rate change it says it's not change, it stays the same. So if the heart rate stays 60 beats per minute, let's say all the time. Well, if you and I exercise, our heart rate is gonna speed up to 100, 120 or whatever we need to get more blood flow to our tissues. If you have a, a situation where your heart rate is gonna stay 60 uh, and not increase, you may have very limited exercise tolerance. So just like those people with coronary disease, you wanna get an idea of what physical things uh, a, a patient with a pacemaker is able to do to make sure it's safe for them and they can, they can take the, um, the stress of, say, swimming against a one-knot current. And then lastly, you got to look at the, uh, the depth rating of the pacemaker. Medtronic, is, who's one of the major pacemaker makes, I'm not um, a strong proponent of them versus anybody else. It's just the data I had. They found that with their pacemakers, their rate responsiveness, so they have pacemakers that as you exercise, will, it will appropriately try to increase the heart rate, as you'd expect, but this rate responsiveness stopped working or began to not work as well once you got below 66 feet uh, and then you had a lower heart rate. Uh, 
and it pressures about a, a, the depths of the, the limits of recreational diving at 132 feet, uh, the titanium can began to actually crush and deform, which does not sound like anything I would really want to have happening. So currently most of the Medtronic devices are rated about 100 feet. There are, however, some, some um, pacemakers, especially some St. Jude's that are uh, depth rated at over 200 feet. And actually I know of a couple of technical divers um, who knew this. Uh, and when they got a pacemaker, they specifically asked their physician for one that was um, rated to over 200 feet. But in general, most of them we rate to at least 100 feet. So for recreational diving, that would be fine. Now defibrillators, those are shock boxes. So those are people who are in dangerously, have dangerous heart rhythms that have to get shocked out of them. So the vast majority of defibrillator patients can't dive, not because they have a defibrillator, but it's because of the company it keeps. It's, it's kind of a not, it's like the Dan will always tell you, if you call in Dan and say, can I dive on this medication? They're not as concerned about the medication as to what condition do you have that's requiring you to have that medication. Uh, it's not that you can't dive on Tegretol or Dilantin. It's that Tegretol and Dilantin are anti-seizure medicines. So if you're requiring anti-seizure medicines, you probably shouldn't be diving, not because of the seizure medicine, because of the seizure history. Um, same thing goes with defibrillators. The defibrillators themselves aren't usually the problem. The problem is the heart that caused them to need a defibrillator in the first place, because most of these people have severe weakening of the heart muscle. They'll have severe underlying coronary disease. They may usually have very poor exercise tolerance. And ventricular tachycardia is that uh, rhythm you see on the medical shows with a bunch of spikes all in a row where people lose consciousness. So the main issue there is, is the heart they come from, not the device itself. So to wrap this up and give us time for some questions, of these five uh, topics we talked about, first was patent frame of valley. Be aware that four types of decompression illness, cerebral, spinal, skin, uh, and inner ear bends are associated with PFO. If you've had recurrent decompression illness of these types, uh, people can stop diving. They can dive conservatively, like we talked about, diving shallower, fewer dives per day, long safety stops, and diving nitrox with your computer set to air. Or in selected cases, they can consider PFO closure, uh, which is an outpatient procedure uh, followed by three months of, anti of antiplatelet therapy uh, and then returning to diving. For patients who have coronary artery disease, they should be assessed for ischemia, which is again, limitation of blood flow with a treadmill. So if the treadmill looks reassuring and they have normal heart muscle function and good exercise tolerance, they can return to diving. From an atrial fibrillation standpoint, the main issue for them is, oral, is being on blood thinners. You can usually control the rate and the symptoms with medications, and that is not a contraindication to diving. Uh, the appropriate patients are placed on blood thinners, and these blood thinners themselves are not an absolute contraindication to diving, but should be at least, uh, the patient should be at least counseled to the increased incidence of more minor things they need to be aware of and uh, do an individual risk assessment for that. As far as the implantable devices, pacemakers, um, the question is kind of why do they have a pacemaker, whether they are pacemaker dependent and what is the depth rating of the device. And for de true defibrillator shock boxes, they're almost always a contraindication of diving uh, based on the fact that they have um, a very poor heart muscle function and so forth. And that's the indication for the device. And I think that's everything I had unless people have some questions on this or any other topic. I, I do have a, thank you, Doug. I do have a few questions in the chat room. If anybody has more questions, go ahead and type them while I ask these first couple of them. Uh, let's start with one that's kind of a definitions question. You referred to both DCS and DCI. Can you explain the difference? It's the same thing. Uh, it used to always be called DCS. So I'm still, I still have a tendency to call it that decompression sickness. Uh, the proper term now would be decompression illness. Um, the key is, with those things is any kind of diving accident, the treatment for any kind of diving accidents from, um, from, the, from being on the boat or the shore is going to be the same. So it's going to be oxygen therapy, whether it's an air gas embolism, whether it's uh, decompression illness, you could try to sort that out based on timing. It doesn't really matter if people are having symptoms after a dive, they're gonna be placed on oxygen and get sent for recompression therapy. But so the idea of decompression illness is probably a better term than decompression sickness. That's really the only, that's the only real difference to, to be concerned about there. Okay. For semantics. Um, with, with the uh, PFO, should divers get, you said they shouldn't typically get tested. What if they're not in the recreational range? What if they're a technical diver or a dive pro that is doing a lot of dives? 
a very good question that comes up a lot um, from a from a dive pro who is diving recreationally. I would I would definitely not recommend doing that. There's lots of people out there who you know 25 percent of dive professionals probably have a PFO just by prevalence in this in the society. But 25 percent of dive pros are not getting bent, so I, I would not recommend doing that. From the technical diving standpoint, it depends. And I've had some people I've talked to about that, and it depends if it's going to change what they do. So there's no point in doing a test unless the outcome of that test is going to change management. So if I've had people tell me that before they spend thousands and thousands of dollars on technical training and gear and so forth, uh, if they were to have a PFO, they would not pursue that. Then I think that will be reasonable to get tested. If they're getting tested just because they want to know, uh, you can do that, but that's opening up a Pandora's box because what are you going to do with that information? Um, to put that in perspective, um, I could very easily get tested for a PFO, right? I mean, I think I have access to, <laughs> to testing to get that done. Uh, I've been diving for 46 years. I've been diving to 400 feet or so, cave diving, you know, way back in deep caves. Do I have a PFO? I have no idea. I've never been tested because it's not going to change anything I do because thankfully I've never been bent. Now, if I got bent tomorrow, uh, especially one of those four types, and I want to keep diving, which I do, then yeah, I would probably get tested. So it really comes down to an individual thing. Some people, if, if you are going to be doing very high risk, uh, your goal is to get towards high risk technical diving. Uh, it's not unreasonable uh, to have a test. Uh, it'll probably be an out-of-pocket expense because there won't be an insurance company that will pay for it because you want to know. Uh, but I would only recommend do that if you've had a, a thorough discussion with a cardiologist and you think it's going to absolutely change what you do based on whether you find one or don't find one. I think perhaps you've already answered this, but is, um, so is there something we should be doing that's preventative for PFOs? If 25% of us have it, is there something we should be doing for preventative? Is there something you think we should be changing in our typical diving profiles knowing that? No, I think it's similar. It's, it's, it's similar to your dive computer. You know, you know, you've got a dive computer, you don't push your dive computer, right? Because you know it's, it, you don't know, it doesn't know anything about you, right? It doesn't know what your age is. It doesn't know what your level of fitness is. It doesn't know what your risk factors are. So the, the feeling is don't push a dive computer. Uh, don't get all the way to the last minute or two. Always be conservative. The same thing we go with this. Because one in four of us may have a PFO and because one in four of us may be at higher risk, that's just one more good reason to be conservative. So anything that you can do to limit inert gas loading is in your is in your best interest, whether or not you have a PFO. So, diving shallower, diving nitrox with air uh, air settings on your computer. By the way, nitrox is safer only if you dive nitrox but have your computer set on air. If you have your if you're still pushing your dive computer on nitrox, it's no safer than diving air. It's the same same concept. But so anything like that and being aware of things, you know. Um, taking a day off in the middle of a dive week, don't doing five dives a day every day for a week or 10 days and getting on an airplane the next morning, you know, any little thing you can do to give yourself some extra time, limit um, inert gas loading and so forth is helpful whether or not you have a PFO, but it's congenital. I mean, like I said, 25% of people have it. Uh, it's nothing you can do to make it close, you know, say, well, I, if I have this thing I could do to try and make it close. No. So um, the risk involved with closure is quite small probably way less than 1% serious complication rates, a couple of percent cases of some palpitations and so forth afterwards, which tend to go away within a couple of weeks. But still, it's an invasive procedure, and I wouldn't recommend doing it um, unless, unless you've had problems, unless you've had true decompression illness. Well, it, it speaks a lot to me. You're a, a technical diver that has done a lot of technical dives, and you you're, and a cardiologist, and you have not done it yourself. So that says a lot. Right. Okay. Um, Next question, a little bit different. Uh, one of the tests that you had recommended, a good easy test for people to think about is two miles in 25 minutes of walking. Um, what are your thoughts on a timed watermanship skills qualifying test? The um, technical diving and INTD, we have to do things like that all the time. It's, it's, the problem is it's hard to quantitate um, swimming as much from a rec from a from an exercise physiology standpoint to know what kind of that level is. Um, obviously, if someone's a competitive swimmer, uh, I don't really care if they can walk two miles in 25 minutes because I know they're in good shape. Um, but yeah, there are some time things if you can if you um, are a good swimmer or swim a lot, um, 
and I wouldn't give you exact times because I don't know them off the top of my head, but that would be a very good thing. So basically the idea is any kind of physical fitness. So if you can swim, you know, 20 minutes against a solid current, you're probably in pretty good shape. The question is, can you, how do you figure that out before you start diving or whatever? So just swimming in a pool may be a little difficult because of which stroke people are using and how much effort they're putting forth and how fast or how slow they're going. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of the very uh, overweight people at the YMCA. They're kind of dog paddling through the water. So they were able to swim 200 yards. Uh, it may have taken them an hour and a half, but they got through it. So um, it's hard. And obviously that person is not very physically fit and you can see other people that are very fit. So timed makes sense. Uh, there's just not a lot of research, a lot of data on what those numbers would be. There are some time numbers through some of the agencies, um, you know, especially in the professional ranks uh, and technical diving as to how fast you have to be able to do things. But that's, in, that's agency dependent and is not from medical research. So from a medical research standpoint, usually it's walking uh, because it's hard to quantitate biking, hard to quantitate cross-country skiing, hard to quantitate swimming like it is to do walking. So that's kind of why the medical community has kind of gone to that direction. But basically what you're looking for is a measure of physical fitness. So if someone's clearly physically fit from swimming, then that's, that's perfectly adequate. I have someone ask, can we flip back to that slide that had the physical, the cardiac fitness? Sure. Uh, hang on, I may have gone, I think I went too far. Here? Very good. I think so. Perfect. Okay, okay. so this one's a little bit, um, so uh, recent history of a cardiac ablation for AFib. Okay. Currently on Zarelto. Okay. Physician is recommending a watchman device procedure. Okay. Is a watchman device affect the ability to dive? No. Uh, I actually put in lots of Watchman device. I'm one of the proctors for the company, so I know Watchman device very well. What that is, in, uh, for the people who are listening, is in atrial fibrillation, like we talked about, this irregular heart rhythm that has an increased risk of stroke, 90% uh, of the clots that cause those strokes come from what's called the left atrial appendage, which is a little pouch that hangs off that top left chamber. So a Watchman device is like putting a cork in a bottle. So it's a little, it's a filter device, um, that is, we kind of spring into place at the opening of that little pouch um, and it holds itself in place. And the idea is it's, it's used mainly for people who have a high risk of stroke, but have a reason not to be on long-term blood thinners. And that's a very nebulous thing. It can be because they've had bleeding on blood thinners. It become, can be because of their lifestyle. Um, so it sounds like this, um, this person's uh, physician thinks they'd be better treated with a watchman device and then come off long-term blood thinners. Um, you can definitely dive with that. It does nothing more. It, it's all it's all in a, uh, a fluid filled space. There's no gas issues to worry about as far as Boyle's law and so forth. Uh, and actually, once it's in place and you're off blood thinners, it'll probably even be safer to dive because then you don't have the issues of bleeding, uh, you know, bleeding risks and so forth with diving. So you definitely can definitely can dive with a watchman device. Okay. Um... In your experience, are diving liveaboard staff usually familiar with things like anticoagulation? No. In general, no. Uh, that's why. Uh, so, you know, that's why you need to think about these ahead of time. Talk to your physician and so forth and so on. But again, you know, I'm not not meaning in disrespect, but uh, but you know, their job is to give you a form, and if you check yes, send you to a doctor, and if you check no, you're good to go. They're not. They're not mm. trained and they don't want to take the liability of making any kind of medical judgments. And I don't blame them in the, in the slightest, you know, or just like in your own, in like a dive ventures, if someone shows up to your dive class uh, and they check yes to something, you're going to send them to a doctor because it's not your place to and they go, well, no, wait a minute, blah, blah, blah. That's not your place to make that decision. You're not been trained to that. You're not going to take that liability. It's the same way with the liveaboard people. They just want, they want to take people diving. They're not looking, they're not like looking just like you aren't looking to keep someone from diving you make money by taking them diving. You want to take them diving, but you got to make sure it's safe. Perfect. All right, so are there questions you would suggest asking prior to going on the trip uh, of the, the life of the liveaboard? Uh, not from that standpoint. Uh, I mean, I think it's always a good idea from the liveaboard to, to look at safety issues. Uh, they should all be safe, but some places in the world may not be as much. So you want to look for things. The main things you want to look for are how safe they run their boat, uh, how their diving operations are, make sure you're not gonna get left at sea, make sure you know what the boarding situations are, make sure they've got plenty of oxygen, make sure you've got an emergency action plan, just like you would for any other dive site. So 
just like you would look at a given dive site, uh, whether it be like we were talking about before the Blue Heron Bridge uh, or a remote Liverpool in Indonesia. You should think, okay, if something bad happens, uh, what's the plan? And make sure that, uh, that the plan is appropriate. So uh, know what the issue is. Like I remember we were diving in Cocos, okay? In Cocos, you're 30 something hours from land, okay? They're not gonna fix that. So if somebody gets bent, it's too far to fly by helicopter. So it's a 24 to 30 hour boat ride back to shore, okay? So they have lots and lots of oxygen, but you're gonna be bent for 24 or 30 hours. So that may be a dive that you don't wanna push things very much. You may wanna stay shallower. You may wanna take a dive off here or two. You may wanna do extra long safety stops because again, if things go sideways, you gotta know what your options are. So with liveaboards, I would just make me mainly look at kind of their safety issues, not necessarily the medical issues. Uh, there's three questions here kind of uh, for warfarin. So warfarin okay. versus DOAC. Okay. Bring oral vitamin K if you're using warfarin. And is there risk stratification to use aspirin rather than warfarin for the trip like you okay. might do prior to surgery? Okay. Uh, let me back up so, to make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music here. So warfarin, warfarin is a, uh, a blood thinner used mainly for atrial fibrillation like we talked about. Um, warfarin, for anybody who cares, uh, works on what's called vitamin K dependent factors. So your, your clotting system has a series of factors that get activated to form a clot. Uh, factors two, seven, nine, and 10 are, require vitamin K as a building block. So one of the ways to quote reverse vitamin K is to or reverse cumin is to take vitamin K. That's where that question comes from. So you could take some oral vitamin K to try and reverse if you were to have a bleeding problem on a liveaboard. That's not unreasonable. I probably wouldn't recommend that, but it's not unreasonable. You do have to worry about becoming hypercoagulable and forming clot if you reverse it too much. So like if we're trying to reverse people for procedures, we don't try to reverse them fully. We try to reverse them partially because you don't want to overshoot. So if you're taking a dose of it on a liveaboard and you're doing that because you say, I'm so far from, um, from medical help that I want to be able to reverse my blood thinner, um, you got to be careful because what you don't want to do is overly reverse it and have a blood clot. Then you've got a blood clot a long ways from shore. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that unless you've discussed that with your physician and you've come up with a game plan. The second part of that question was um, regarding the uh, warfarin versus what are called the NOAX, the DOAX, which are the new oral anticoagulants. That's the ones, again, you hear about on television, uh, which are things like uh, Pradaxa, Eliquis, uh, and Xarelto. They... Coumadin, uh, which has been around forever, warfarin or coumadin has been around forever, is a very dirty drug. Everyone hates it. It takes, it's got very variable doses. Some people may, may take one milligram, some may take 15 milligrams. Uh, because of that, you have to monitor blood levels. It interacts with everything. You got to be careful what you eat. You got to be careful what medications you take. So doctors hate it. Nurses hate it. Patients hate it. Everybody hates it. Uh, so because of that, the drug companies who are not stupid uh, develop these newer, uh, newer uh, uh, agents which are a much cleaner drugs. They actually affect individual clotting factors. So drugs like Pradaxa affect factor two. Um, the other drugs like Xarelto and Eliquis affect factor 10. Um, so they're a little bit cleaner. So you don't have to have the monitoring like you would with Coumadin. Uh, you don't have to worry about food uh, interactions, uh, specifically green leafy vegetables, because that has a lot of vitamin K, which could affect Coumadin. Uh, and you don't have to worry about very many medications or some bizarre medications, but mainline medications don't interact with these medicines either. They were all tested against Coumadin. They've not been tested against each other, but they've been tested against Coumadin. Uh, and all have been shown to be equally as effective and a little bit lower bleeding risk, uh, but they also are more expensive. Um, so the advantage of them is a much cleaner drug. You don't have to worry about as much about all the interactions. You don't have to have monitoring. Um, uh, the downside, some of them are more expensive and they probably have a little bit less bleeding. And I forgot what the third question was. It was something else. What was the third part of that question? Uh, so vitamin K, if using warfarin. warfarin. Okay, that's so we did we did attack that. So the first, so did I cover all of that? So we talked about uh, what warfarin so. was and and vi the the differences and then uh, the vitamin K and so forth. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm. Oh, going I know to the third part was about stopping it. I think the third part was about aspirin. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, the uh, yeah, I knew there was something. So the issue there okay. is there have been studies. If assuming we're talking about atrial fibrillation, which is the most common reason people would be on these blood thinners. Uh, looking at aspirin versus placebo versus uh, a true blood thinner, aspirin has a very minimal effect. It doesn't actually decrease stroke and atrial fibrillation. So uh, if you are going to stop an oral anticoagulant uh, for a liveaboard trip, 
uh, taking aspirin instead of that will make you feel better about yourself, but probably is not decreasing your stroke risk. Um, that is all going to be, you can actually figure out uh, if you want to do this mathematically, if you're you know, that kind of a numbers person, if you've got a, what's called a Chad's vast score of four. So let's say you're, you're 75 years, or let's say 65 years old, you have uh, high blood pressure, a little bit of diabetes, and you're a woman, that'd be a Chad's vast score of four. That's going to give you about a 4% chance uh, of having a stroke every year if you're not on blood thinners. So if you want to work out the math, I'm not going to do it here, but you could say 4% over 365 days, that's your incident per day. You're going to be on the liveaboard for seven days. That's my stroke risk during that week. So do I want to take that risk by, and then not take my blood thinners to avoid bleeding? Or do I not want to take that risk and I'll stay on my blood thinners and take a small risk of bleeding? So that, that's how that goes. Uh, as an example, uh, my father, when we used to, he was in his 70s and was skiing, uh, was on Coumadin. And he would go off his Coumadin for a week to go snow skiing because um, he thought his likelihood of hitting his head and bleeding was higher than his risk of stroke at that time. And he would just go back on it when he got home. So that's an individual decision. But, that, but, I, but the, re, the, the take home there is aspirin doesn't prevent stroke so, and atrial fibrillation. So either take the, the blood thinner or don't take the blood thinner. If you want to take aspirin, you're probably fooling yourself that it's going to make any difference, and it does increase bleeding risks so, compared to nothing. So that's, I'd either take the medicine or not take it, but I don't think substituting aspirin is going to be particularly helpful. Okay. Um, I'm unmuting Chris, who has a question. Sure. Go ahead, Chris. Um, so I'm one of the uh, dive instructors uh, at Dive Ventures out of Omaha office. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, I'm also a tech diver and I'm, I'm a little bit insane. I like doing the, the deep cave penetration uh, dives as well. So uh, I like hearing about your background. Uh, my question, I had two, is if I have someone that is at risk or let's say they have a PFO or something like that and they are showing concerns, is there any benefit? I would never talk to them about their medicine. I, I just... I want them to talk to their cardiologist and doctor. I'm not going to get in there, but if I were to, is there a benefit for them diving with nitrox or trimix for someone that is in it? Because it would reduce their inert gas intake if they were just staying right. Right. Uh, you kind of, you went off there for a second, but yeah, it's, it's again, the issue with PFO is the inert gas load. So anything you can do that decreases the inert gas load will be helpful. So, if you were diving uh, on air, okay, you're going to have a much higher gas load than if you're diving on nitrox, unless you push the nitrox. So again, you'd want to just make sure that people built in some conservatism. So the idea there again would be to minimize your inert gas, whether that is minimizing nitrogen or minimizing helium uh, with higher partial pressures uh, as tolerated and as is safe. Uh, and then if you're doing technical diving, you'd, as opposed to long safety stops, you just want to pad decompression. So um, for people who know things about like gradient factors and so forth, you'd want to have a, a, small, a smaller number for your second gradient factor. So rather than push to like a 100% or even 90 or 80, you know, something like a 40, 70 or 30, 70. Uh, and then even after that padding decompression. So, so the way to avoid things is to stay shallow for longer. So I tell people who are technical divers worried about a PFO, they should dive their computers, dive conservatively, set it very conservatively, and then add deco on top of that, shallow deco on top of that. Okay, thank you. My second question is, um, I know there's been a lot of on uh, the effects of nitrogen uh, and on the body, but what about um, in your experience of both diving and being a cardiologist is long-term exposure to uh, oxygen intake. So, you know, say I dive on 40% for long periods of time, you know, increased oxygen. Have you noticed or seen anything in your dive career or your uh, professional career on long-term exposure to high percentages of oxygen? Minimal. There's been some reports of uh, some increasing issues um, with high partial pressures of oxygen, but it's, it's, mainly from a medic from people who've been on long-term oxygen for other reasons uh you know lung issues or whatever from a diving standpoint it's difficult because even if you quote dive a lot on those things you're still it's minimal amounts of time i mean just think about it, even if you were doing four hours a day 
uh, of high partial pressures, that's still 20 hours a day of normal partial pressures of oxygen. So it's, it's hard to show anything. So it's, it's, an, it's potentially a problem, um, you know, especially like for an oxygen clock and so forth from your technical diving standpoint, you know, with pulmonary issues. Um, but has, I've not seen any long-term effects. Short-term effects from lots of oxygen, sure. As far as long-term issues, I've not seen anything to, to make me want to change any kind of recommendations on that. Okay. And then if you ever need a case study, if you ever do one, you need a volunteer to be on there. I'm, you're, I'm, you're the guy, huh? Yep. Okay, I'll keep you in mind for that for sure. And if you come to Florida, let me know. We'll go cave diving together. Uh, my parents are in Venice, and I used to dive Florida underwater sports with Tim. I don't know him, but okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Place. Cool. Um, let's see. I've got uh, a follow-up question on the Watchman device. How long after the procedure should you wait to dive? Okay. The um, you brought it from from the Watchman itself device, you could probably dive the following day, but I wouldn't recommend that. Um, there's a couple of issues. One is going to be you got to heal up your groins, so the, it's a needle stick uh, in the groin. It's a fairly large venous stick, so you'd probably want to wait at least a few days for the skin to heal. From a medication standpoint, the, the FDA recommendation, though not everyone does this, but the FDA recommendation uh, is people go home on low-dose aspirin and they go home on warfarin. Uh, and they do that for six weeks because that's the way it was tested. After six weeks, they can go to aspirin and Plavix. And after six months, they can go to aspirin alone. So the recommendation probably would be to wait probably six weeks. That way you get off the aspirin and blood thinner combination. So you're, that's a pretty significant bleeding risk. Uh, and also give a chance for your groins to kind of heal up, make sure there's not going to be any kind of infection risk from soaking in salt water and so forth. So there's no hard, hard, fast rules on that, but probably if you could, if you could avoid diving to get off of that combination of aspirin and Coumadin, that would uh, get you back to normal tolerance and get your groins and stuff to heal up and also get you off the bleeding risk. So probably, probably six weeks is a reasonable number. If someone came to me and said they've got a trip of a lifetime that's going to be occurring three weeks after their watchman procedure, could they dive? Sure, there's gonna be a little bit higher, little bit higher risk, but it wouldn't be that. So it's not an absolute thing, but that's just if you can wait that long, that would be great. Okay, perfect. Uh, the last one that I think I have right now is: um, Are there any resources to find cardiologists or doctors that are knowledgeable about diving in our area? Yeah, call the Divers Alert Network. They they have the largest uh, database of um, of diving doctors in the world, uh, and they can refer you someone in your area. Um, if people have just questions, they're welcome to email me. Uh, I'm happy to do that. But if you actually want to see someone, I'd recommend calling uh, Divers Alert Network and ask for a referral to someone in your area. Okay. I, the, I have several comments about what a great presentation this was. We appreciate that you uh, toned it down a little bit for us in layman terms, and it's very easy to understand and very helpful. So. I appreciate your time tonight, Doug. This has been really fun and interesting. So thank you very much. It was very informative. Well, thank you so much. If there's other things thank I you. can talk about, I'm more than happy to do in the future for you, whatever I can do to help. I appreciate that. We, we will call on you again, I'm sure. This okay, thank great. you so much. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Come to the next one next week. Bye. Okay, bye now.